What's going down? Give me Liberty fans. We have a very exciting chapter for you. This one is chapter eight of the fourth edition. And all of these topics and more will be covered. So make sure you are an expert. It can identify and explain each one of these bubbles. All right, let's get started. So let's talk about Alexander Hamilton, Secretary of the Treasury under Washington, and his financial plan. I do have a detailed video. Check it out in the description. This was a contributor to the emergence of political parties. Now, I don't know about you, but for me, this screams a short answer question. What were reasons for the emergence of political parties as well as impacts of them? So let's take a look and see why was this dude's plan so divisive that it helped create political parties? Well, there were five parts. Number one, federal government would pay off all of the debt plus interest. That doesn't sound too bad, right? So we're going to pay all the debt at face value plus interest. New bonds would be issued to pay off old debt and the federal government would assume state debts. Ah, here's where it gets a little tricky because states like Virginia in the South had little to no debt and Massachusetts had a lot of debt. So Massachusetts was getting bailed out while Virginia was getting nothing. It created the Bank of the United States, also known as the bus. I'll refer to it as the bus from here on forward. And this would issue notes and make loans to the government. Here was the most divisive part of his plan. He argued that it was constitutional because the Constitution did not forbid the creation of the bus. So he, he took on a loose interpretation, whereas Jefferson is going to take on a strict interpretation and say, no, bro, can't do that. Number four, an excise tax. And an excise tax is a tax on domestically manufactured goods, most notably whiskey. And we'll see the impacts of that. And five, a tariff, which is a tax on foreign goods. Be familiar with all five parts. He also proposed government subsidies or government giving money or tax breaks to industries, but this part did not occur. So Hamilton favored trade with Britain because he saw the economy prospering that way. And Jefferson and his followers favored agriculture. They love to farm. So that in and of itself is going to be a dividing issue between the two. Jefferson feared Hamilton's vision could create too powerful of a government, too similar to the one that they just overthrew from Great Britain. Now, speculators during the Articles of Confederation time period bought bonds for pennies on the dollar. And under Hamilton's financial plan, when the federal government would pay off all the debt plus interest, they would make a lot of money. So Jefferson and people who opposed the plan were like, that's not fair. Some rich people are going to make a lot more money. Now, the South opposed Hamilton's plan because there's little manufacturing and there are fewer bondholders. So how are you going to get the South to support this plan? That was the challenge facing Hamilton. And Jefferson, as I mentioned, he strictly interpreted the Constitution and believed the bus was unconstitutional. So ultimately, the two get together over dinner and Jefferson agrees to support the plan and get the South to support it if the new capital would be built in the South. And this is from land from Virginia, Washington, D.C. This is why Washington, D.C. is located in the South. Let's jump over 1789. In France, July 14th to be specific, we have the storming of the... Bastille. So in 1789, it began, many Americans supported it because they're like, yo, they're taking our ideas and they're overthrowing their monarch. This is fantastic. Jefferson in particular was ecstatic. Almost immediately, war between France and Britain broke out and Washington is going to issue a proclamation of neutrality, even though the U.S. still had it on the books in alliance with France dating back to the American Revolution. So France is going to be upset, as will Jefferson and his supporters. Now, Britain's going to continue impressing American soldiers or kidnapping American sailors and forcing them into the Navy. And they're going to confiscate U.S. goods headed to France's county. So they're not very respective of our neutral trading rights. So Washington sends John Jay, the first Chief Justice of the United States, over to Britain for a treaty. And what this does... Although the two sides hammer out treaty, there's no mention of impressment, and Britain promised to abandon posts or forts, which, by the way, they promised to do at the end of the Revolutionary War, and they still did not. And this is a direct contributor to the emergence of the political party. So Jay's treaty, which really is tied into the French Revolution, and Hamilton's financial plan helped lead to political parties. And France was not happy, neither was Jefferson and his followers. So Federalists, who were they? Well... They tend to be pro-Hamilton's financial plan, pro-British because of trading, they favored manufacturing, and they tended to be located in New England. They also favored or advocated wealthy and elites in public office, and they were kind of weary of average everyday Americans voting. The Whiskey Rebellion occurs in Pennsylvania, and this is where farmers in Pennsylvania rebelled against the new excise tax. 
Washington gets on his horse, his white horse named Nelson, and he puts the rebellion down. And this really demonstrates the power of the new government under the Constitution. You can compare that with the weakness of the federal government under the Articles during Shays' Rebellion. Now, the Republican Party or the Democratic Republicans or the Jeffersonians, by the way, they have nothing to do with today's Republicans. They were led by Jefferson and Madison. They were pro-France because of the age during the American Revolution. They were anti bus They favored farming. And they got their support from farmers. And they believed in more democratic participation. The creation of post offices really helped spread information across the country. We're talking about hundreds of different post offices. Hundreds of new newspapers emerged in the 1790s. So lots of people were kept up to date with current affairs. Democratic Republican societies emerged in, in taverns and in big cities, and they argued that political liberty was more than just voting. They argued for involvement in politics. They were blamed for inciting the Whiskey Rebellion, and they disappeared in 1795. And it's important to know that many immigrants tended to support the Republicans or the Jeffersonians during this time. Keep that in mind as we move forward. We'll see it in a couple minutes. So we have Mary Wollstonecraft who writes a book, A Vindication of the Rights of Women. By the way, she had a daughter, Shelley, who wrote the very popular book, Frankenstein. And Mary argued for more rights such as education, paid employment for women, which would benefit single women who are not married. Hannah Adams was another woman who became the first woman to make a living from being an author. And there were many calls for educational opportunities for women during this time. That ties in with the idea of Republican motherhood. Women count as population towards representation in the House of Representatives, but few believe that women should vote. All right, jumping over to John Adams' presidency, second president of the United States. Let's take a look at the election of 1796. It is Adams versus Jefferson, and Adams, a Federalist, you see, wins all of New England and the North. And Jefferson is going to take virtually all of the South. Adams wins 71 to 68. Now, under the old rules, the original rules in the Constitution, Jefferson became VP because he was the runner-up. Remember, no mention of the political parties in the Constitution, so the second-place finisher would be runner-up. France and Britain during this time, they continued to seize U.S. trading ships with the other countries. So if the U.S. was trading with France, Britain would seize the ship. If the U.S. was trading with Britain, France would seize the ship. This led to the XYZ affair. Three diplomats from the U.S. are sent to, Fran to France and three French agents named X, Y, and Z or X, Y, and Z, you French speaking people, they demanded a bribe to meet with them. They were like, ho, 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 give us a bribe to meet with uh, our officials. It's okay, my stepdad's French, I can say that. So war hysteria ensues in the United States, and this is known as the quasi-war with France. So for a couple years, we're attacking each other's ships. And eventually, though, in 1800, a peace treaty is signed. Once Napoleon takes over France, because he's like, listen, I'm going to be taking over all of Europe. I don't want to mess with you, America. I don't want to worry about you right now. So the Alien Sedition Acts, holy cow, no this. Remember when I said many immigrants tended to support the Republicans? Let's connect that to the Alien Act. Now, both of these were passed by the Federalists to silence political opposition, specifically the Jeffersonians. Jeffersonians are upset with the quasi-war. They're pro-France. So the Federalists want to make sure that they're not going to be criticized. This is a blatant violation of the First Amendment, but they didn't really care at the time. The Alien Act said that the president could deport foreigners deemed dangerous. So any of these foreigners who are outspoken, boom, you're out of the country. There's also a Naturalization Act, which increased the amount of years required to be a citizen, which meant that these new immigrants couldn't vote. And the Sedition Act, this made it illegal to criticize the government. This would expire in 1801 in case the Federalists were no longer in power. Now they could talk smack about the Jeffersonians. It's really actually kind of brilliant the way they set this up. This was aimed at silencing supporters of Jefferson. I can't stress enough, Alien Sedition Acts, passed by the Federalists, wanted to silence their opponents, the Jeffersonians. Know that, know that, know that. Okay, so in response, Jefferson and Madison, they're not going to take this quietly. So they authored the Virginia and Kentucky Resolutions. They were protesting the Alien Sedition Acts. They believed the acts to be unconstitutional. They were more symbolic than anything. But they were later used by Southerners, such as John C. Calhoun in the 1820s and the 1830s. Now, let's take a look at the election of 1800. The way it was set up, voters were supposed to, to, to also elect Aaron Burr as Jefferson's vice president. Now, due to a quirk, the two of them tied in electoral votes. So it goes to the House of Representatives, according to the Constitution. And on the 36th ballot, it takes 36 times, the House ultimately decides to choose Jefferson 
over Burr. Burr actually could have been president in 1800. Burr is his vice president. Now, ironically, Hamilton backed Jefferson. Hamilton, who hated Jefferson, hated Burr more, so he encouraged the House to support Jefferson. Now, the 12th Amendment is added to the Constitution, which required separate ballots for the president and the vice president. So we would never have a tie like that again in 1800. Now, Jefferson called the election of 1800 a revolution because he stated it was a peaceful transition of power between political parties. The first time that opposing political parties change power. I have a video on that in the description. Check it out. I got a whole bunch of videos for this chapter. If not for the three-fifths compromise, Adams would have won in 1800 because the South had more representation due to the amount of slaves it had. Many feared that the abolishment of slavery would be too politically divisive, so a lot of people just did not want to touch the slavery issue, which will lead to pro only more problems in the coming years. Okay, jumping on over to Haiti, there was a slave rebellion in 1791, which Jeffersonians did not support, even though they supported the French Revolution. Toussaint Louverture, here he is, he led the rebellion, and eventually in 1804, Haiti is going to gain independence. Many slave owners in the U.S. were fearful of this because they thought it would encourage slave rebellions here. And in 1800, we have G Gabriel's Rebellion. This was a planned rebellion in Virginia never materialized and 26 slaves were hanged. Just like every other slave rebellion we've studied and will study, stricter laws will be established after. So for example, blacks couldn't gather on Sundays with whites in Virginia after this rebellion. And owner emancipation became much more difficult. Jumping over to Jefferson in his inaugural address, he says, we are all Republicans, we are all Federalists, basically saying, I don't care what, member you're, uh, what political party you're a member of, we're all Americans. He also pardoned those that were arrested on, and imprisoned under the Sedition Act, and he reduced the size of the military. Now, in 1803, we have a very famous court case. I have a video in the description. It's called Marbury versus Madison. Now, on the last few days of office for John Adams, he appointed a whole bunch of new judges that were pretty Federalist leaning. Now, James Madison, who is Jefferson's Secretary of State, he was supposed to give papers or commissions to these judges saying that they could be judges. He refused to deliver the commission to Marbury, to William Marbury. So he's like, you know what, Madison? I'm going to sue you. I'll see you in court. He's like, give me my papers, yo. So the Supreme Court declared in 1803 in Marbury versus Madison, part of the Judiciary Act of 1789 unconstitutional. They're like, Marbury, we feel your pain. You should be a judge, but there's really not much we can do about it. We don't have the power to enforce it. So what do you need to know about Marbury versus Madison? At all costs, know this. The court case established judicial review. What does judicial review mean? It is the ability of the Supreme Court to declare a law unconstitutional. It's not mentioned in the Constitution. They essentially gave it to themselves. Now, a couple years later in Fletcher versus Peck, the Supreme Court stated it could also declare state laws unconstitutional. So we see the federal government becoming more strong at the expense of states. According to the John Marshall, who is the chief justice through all these cases, the government could not impair contracts. A contract was a contract, and the government can't impair them or take it away. Let's jump on over to Louisiana. Well, in 1795, we have picked these treaty. The U.S. gained access to the Mississippi River and the right of deposit or the ability to store goods in New Orleans. Jefferson won in New Orleans, but he ended up buying all of the Louisiana territory, and it doubled the size of the U.S. This is present-day Jackson Square, where the French flag was lowered and the U.S. flag was raised in New Orleans. Jefferson, however, is going to switch from strict to loose interpretation. All the Federalists are going to be like, you can't do that, you hypocrite. You were just complaining when we argued for loose interpretation, but he switches his interpretation. Jefferson switched from strict to loose. Jefferson switched from strict to loose. Jefferson switched from strict to loose. Know that. Lewis and Clark explored the purchase. They saw the waterway of Pacific, never saw it, but they did acquire new plants and animals. Free blacks in the territory of Louisiana have many rights under the French and the Spanish, and unfortunately they're going to lose pretty much all of them at a pretty quick rate once the land is acquired by the U.S. So the U.S. finds itself involved with some pirates. The Barbary states they demanded tribute from the united states and jefferson's finally like we're not going to pay this so he expands the navy and um defeats the the barbaries for a little bit they continue to harass and eventually after the war of 1812 the harassment stops so the british are going to continue the policy of impressment or kidnapping american sailors they needed men to fight napoleon in europe 
6,000 American sailors were impressed during this time. So Jefferson's going to respond with the Embargo Act, which will cut off all trade with the rest of the world. That was a huge disaster economically for the United States. Two years later, we had the Non-Intercourse Act, which banned trade with only Britain and France and reopened trade to the rest of the world, but it still hurt a lot because Britain and France were such powerful players in the commerce game. Now, Madison easily becomes the next president in 1808, and he is pressured for war. Under his administration, Macon's Bill No. 2 is passed, which will reopen trade with France. An embargo will be placed on Britain, which will really anger Britain. And we have a cause of the War of 1812 is a group of war hawks. They are young congressmen from the South and the West. People like Henry Clay, my boy Henry Clay, and Dracula, I mean John C. Calhoun. Look at that. Does he not look like Dracula? You know he does. Yeah, that's not fair. This is a much older picture of John C. Calhoun. So the War of 1812 breaks out, also known as the Second War of Independence. Some natives embraced becoming civilized, or what Americans considered civilized, which is adopting farming and giving up traditional native lifestyle. Guys, we'll be talking about this for the next 80 years in this course. Tecumseh was a very charismatic Native American leader that resisted Americans. The Battle of Tippy Canoe, future President William Henry Harrison defeated Native Americans. So this will help catapult him to the presidency in 1840. And the War of 1812, definitely know the causes. We have impressment and also arming of Natives on the frontier by the British. Most of the North was against the war because of trading, especially in New England. The White House was burned. James Madison will actually flee the White House, leaving his wife behind, and she'll gather like paintings and silver and different things in the White House to despair from the fire. Tecumseh will be killed at the Battle of the Thames, and he will allegedly put a curse on the presidency. And Andrew Jackson in the, in the Battle of New Orleans will become an overnight sensation, an overnight hero. Finally, the war will be settled with the Treaty of Ghent, which... Ended the war and, and recognized no territory being gained or lost. It pretty much was status quo what it was like before. No mention of impressment either in the treaty. So what's the aftermath of the war? While well, the British and the native threat is essentially gone to America from this point forward, there's a huge increase in nationalism in the United States because of the Battle of New Orleans. Here is Andrew Jackson. The Americans just absolutely destroyed the British here. Like 2,000 British casualties to like 60 Americans or some ridiculous numbers like that. They whooped the British. Ironically, this battle happened about two weeks after the Treaty of Ghent. News was so slow to come over to the United States, they were still fighting even though the treaty had been signed. Canada did not embrace the U.S. as previously thought. The U.S. went into Canada to fight and was thinking that Canada would be like, let us be a part of the United States. Did not happen. And the Federalist Party is really going to decline from this moment forward. In December of 1814, at the end of the war, they met in Hartford. A bunch of Federalist delegates met at the Hartford Convention. They shared their grievances and they sought to amend the Constitution. They wanted increased requirements to declare war, to impose embargo, and add new states. They're worried about being outvoted. Now, the Federalists got a bad rap because of because of this meeting, because nationalism is sweeping the nation, and they're looking like they're anti-patriotic. So really, the Federalist Party ceases to exist during this time, and we'll go into what is known as, as an era of good feelings. All right, let's do a quick recap. Hamilton's financial plan, know the parts, impacts of French and Indian of the French Revolution and political parties, the Whiskey Rebellion, reasons for the emergence and characteristics of the first political parties. Whiskey Rebellion, again, no idea why it's on there twice, but I guess it's that important. The XYZ Affair, know what that is and how that contributed to tensions between the French and the U.S. And holy cow, the Alien Sedition Acts. Remember, Silence Who? Yeah, the Jeffersonians and Federalist opponents. That led to the Virginia Kentucky Resolutions. What the heck was the Revolution of 1800? Judicial Review, what is it? Causes of the War of 1812 and Impacts of the War of 1812 as well. All right, guys, look forward to seeing you back here for Chapter 9. I appreciate you watching. We'll get into this dude, Eli Whitney. If you have any questions or comments, feel free to leave them in the section below. Have a good day.